Strange Wills. Starring the distinguished Hollywood actor Warren William and featuring Lorene Tuttle with Howard Culver and an all-star Hollywood cast. Original music by Del Castillo. Dead men's wills are often strange. We do not attempt to understand them or try to find the answers. We can but tell the story. This is Warren William to tell you the story of the girl in cell 13. But first, a word from your announcer. And now, back to Warren William as John Francis O'Connell in The Girl in Cell 13. The history of the Tears of the Madonna, the most precious, perfectly matched pair of rubies ever found by man, is as colorful as the gems themselves. And their blood-red radiance is symbolic of the blood that has run freely throughout the pages of history in the quest for possession of these two priceless gems. For the past five years, the Tears of the Madonna had been in the possession of Charles Ashbrook, retired insurance executive. A bachelor, he lived in strict seclusion, attended only by his secretary, Malcolm Stewart, and the charming, intelligent Sandra Lane. Upon Miss Lane's very beautiful shoulders had fallen the task of buying most of the gems and precious stones in the famous Ashbrook Collection. Her knowledge of the histories of rare stones was exceptional. I always liked to visit Charles Ashbrook, if for no other reason than to see the tears of the Madonna. So, when I was invited over on a Sunday night, I lost no time in accepting. Glad to see you, John. Glad to see you. It's quite mutual, Charles, believe me. And how are the tears tonight? The tears? <laughs> you and the tears of the Madonna. Well, you're going to be surprised by what I've decided to do with them. Do with them? You don't mean to tell me you intend to sell them? No, not sell. That is farthest from my mind. I'm going to give them away. Oh, now, I know you're joking. Why, the tears are worth a king's ransom. Oh, be patient. Wait till I tell you my plan. Then you may comment. I've sent for Sandra. She'll be down in just a moment. I want her to hear what I have to tell you. Well, if it has to do with giving away the tears of the Madonna, I know she won't like it. She loves those rubies even more than I do. And I have every reason to believe that what you say is true, John. But you see, those rubies don't rightfully belong to me. Don't belong to you? No, no, let me finish. <laughs> I'm sorry, child. Those rubies haven't belonged to anyone since the year 1200. You see, John, they were stolen from a Lama monastery in the High Tibet... Originally, they were the eyes of the goddess Sing Kapa. One day, a horde of wild horsemen under the leadership of Kublai Khan invaded Tibet. The temple is empty. Everyone has fled. Look. Look at that idol on the high altar. The eyes. They blaze with the red fire of hate. Fool. Those eyes are precious rubies. Blood red rubies. Rubies? Then we must take them in the name of Kubla Khan. Come. Wait, I will climb up. Hand me your knife. Now then, out they come. Look out. Look out, the idol is trembling. It's falling. Jump, jump. Jump. 
dead. My friend is dead. It is an ill omen. An ill omen. Well, John, that's how the tears of the Madonna began their strange history and left a trail of blood and death behind them. If I may interrupt two handsome gentlemen. Why, of course, Sandra, come in. Oh, we've been waiting for you. Mr. O'Connell, it's so nice to see you again. Thank you, Miss Lane. Our friend Charles has just started telling me about the tears, how they were first stolen by the soldiers of Kublai Khan from a monastery in High Tibet. And I told a good story, too, Sandra. <laughs> in fact, just the way you told it to me. <laughs> oh, just as I suspected. Miss Lane is the one who knows all about the tears. Uh, right, John. She can tell you more about these rubies than anyone on Earth. And she took years in putting the story together. You know, John, you wouldn't believe what I'm about to say, but it's true, every word. Sandra Lane loves the tears of the Madonna beyond all human reason or understanding. I uh, sometimes wonder what she's going to do when... When, when what, I, Mr. Ashbrook? When I uh, dispose of them tonight. But you're not serious. Tell me you're not serious. Oh, you see what I mean, John? Look at her, eyes full of horror, mouth open, face flushed. Stop it, stop it, will you please? Will you answer me? Tell me you're not serious. Unfortunately, I am. Unfortunately for me, and, well, as I see it, even more unfortunately for you, Sandra. That's why I asked John over tonight. You see, John, I'm going to make a will here tonight. My last written declaration. And, well, well, why should I keep you all in suspense any longer? Uh, pardon me just a moment, please. Yes? Uh, Malcolm, would you come down to the study, please? Yes. Yes, of course, Mr. Ashbrook. And, uh, Malcolm, bring down a notebook. I want you to take a few notes for Mr. O'Connell. He's going to prepare my last will and testament. Well then, Charles, that brings us down to the last item, the jewels of the Madonna. You've taken down everything preceding, haven't you, Malcolm? Yes, sir. Yes, I have. I'll transcribe everything for you while you're at supper. Oh, you can let it go until morning, Malcolm. I don't expect to die as quickly as all that. Well, all right, sir. Well, then, uh, let's get back to the tears. They're well named, those tears of the Madonna. I told you, John, how they were taken from the idol in the Lama Monastery... Supposing, Sandra, you tell us the rest of the story. Uh, just the highlights, of course. Because, actually, you could write a book about it, couldn't you? Quite easily, I'm afraid. And each page will be filled with robbery, murder, and sudden death. Mm, sounds ominous. Ominous is a mild word. The priests of the temple placed a curse on the tears until they would one day be returned to the eyes at Sing Ka Pa. Their curse has been very effective. Almost as bad as the story of our own Hope Diamond. Only more effective. The high priest decreed death to all who walk in their shadow. Death to all who walk in their shadow. Well, now. <laughs> Our friend Charles doesn't look like a walking corpse to me, Sandra. So far, he has avoided the curse. Oh, of course, I've only owned the tears for five years. Give me time, John. Give me time. Death does not always come at once, gentlemen. Sometimes it comes stealthily like a shadow. Sometimes it strikes swiftly like lightning. Please tell me what happened in the past to those who walked in the shadow. Kublai Khan was murdered as he slept. And the tears disappeared for over a century. Who got them? No one knows. But next they turned up in the Cathedral of Milan. That's where they acquired their present name, Tears of the Madonna. And were they stolen from the cathedral? Yes, they were, and that's not all. In 1536, Milan was sacked by Spain. The city pillaged, the populace put to the sword. And Spain got the tears? No, they never reached Spain. Mm. They were stolen before the Spaniards left Milan. The two men who were guarding them had their... their throats cut. Now you can see how lucky I've really been, John. Owning the tears and still being in one piece. <laughs> <laughs> I still think, Charles, that avarice had much more to do with it than some pagan curse. Avarice or curse. The tears disappeared again for 50 years until they became the gift of the sultan to his favorite wife. Oh, that's quite an evolution. From the cathedral to the sultan's favorite wife. Oh, it was much more than that. 
One night her chambers were entered as she slept. And that was the untimely end of the Sultan's favorite. Her body disappeared into the river and the tears of the Madonna disappeared into the night. What a nice, pleasant little background. You know, Charles, I can well see your point in getting rid of them. Oh, I can't say that I'm superstitious about the curse, John. And the tears have been one of my greatest delights. Well, Sandra? Well, the record speaks for itself. 27 known murders, 12 by knife, 9 by gun, 6 by strangling. The rest... Just miscellaneous. Well, now, John, that you've heard, here is my final wish on the matter. I'm going to turn over these jewels to your safekeeping as sort of trustee. That paragraph in my will will go into immediate effect. I want you personally to see to it that the tears of the Madonna are returned to the rightful owner, the Lama Monastery in High Tibet. <laughs> oh, no, not for me. I thought I was your friend, Charlie. After all, who am I to fall heir to the curse of the pagan idol? <laughs> I don't like shadows. I couldn't rest easily, John, unless I know this final bequest achieved fulfillment. I must depend upon you not only as my attorney, but as my friend. Well, Sandra, what do you say are my chances of survival? Who knows, Mr. O'Connell? After all, Mr. Ashbrook is still among the living, isn't he? Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, Don. Sorry, Sandra? Oh, yes, I know. You're sorry to see the tears leave us. And I can't say that I blame you. Perhaps I should have left them to a museum where all the world can see them. Who knows whether I'm right or wrong in my decision. But if I can stop the succession of murders, if I can end the monstrous evil that has followed in the wake of the tears, then I shall be more than repaid. But right or wrong... This is my final decision. Three days later, the final will of Charles Ashbrook was duly executed. I agreed to meet him at the bank at two o'clock, where he was to turn over the tears to my safekeeping. Two o'clock came and passed, and he'd not arrived. I called his home, but there was no answer. I waited till the bank closed and Charles Ashbrook had not come. I got into my car and listened to the radio. We interrupt this program to bring you the following bulletin. Charles Ashbrook, retired capitalist and wealthy gem collector, was found dead in his car early this afternoon by county highway policemen. A coroner's report just released states that death was caused by a knife wound which pierced his heart. At a late hour, police have advanced no theory as to why Ashbrook was apparently murdered. Charles Ashbrook murdered? I couldn't believe it. Had the curse of sudden death caught up to him? Was this the answer of the pagan goddess Tsingkapa or the challenge of the deadly sin of greed? I meant to find out. It was high time for action. Part two of The Girl in Cell 13 in just a moment. But first, a brief message from your announcer.
And now back to The Girl in Cell 13 with Warren William as John Francis O'Connell. Back in my office, I called my old friend, Police Commissioner Holbrook. Commissioner Holbrook? Dan, this is John. John O'Connell. Oh, hello, John. I suppose you heard the news about Ashbrook. Yes, I just heard a bulletin on the air. You know, Dan, criminal law is a little out of my field, but I just have a hunch... Well, I wish somebody would enlighten me. So far, we have no clues, no motive, and no suspects. I think, Dan, I can furnish answers to all three. To all three? Holy smokes, where are you now? In my office. But tell me one thing, Dan. What's that? Were there, by chance, two rubies found on the body? The tears of the Madonna. Two rubies? Tears of the Madonna? Say, was Ashbrook carrying around two rubies? Yes, Dan. You see, he was to have turned them over to me at the bank this afternoon. They were to begin a return trip to a pagan goddess in Tibet. Well, there's our motive, all right. No, no rubies were found, John. No tears of the Madonna. But you can bet your bottom dollar that there's going to be a lot of my tears that are going to fall if I don't get a lead and quickly. Listen, I'll send a squad car over to pick you up. There's one cruising in your district now. I'll radio him. I'll be ready, Dan. Believe me. Well, Dan, that's the story. From here on, it's your job. Well, it isn't hard to understand now why Ashbrook was murdered. The motive is as old as Adam, greed. I'll have Stuart and Sandra Lane picked up and brought in for questioning. No doubt they'll have the answers. But it wasn't as simple as I'd hoped. Five long, endless days went by, and neither Malcolm Stewart nor Sandra Lane were found. What had happened to them? And where were the tears of the Madonna? Then, about a week later... Hello? John, is this John O'Connell? Yes. Hello, Commissioner. Come over right away, John. One of the suspects has been picked up. It's this Malcolm Stewart fellow. The police found him in Texas. Then, So did far, he... not a glimmer. He says he ran away because he had a previous record. Previous record, eh? I'll be right over. I tell you, Commissioner, I did not kill Mr. Ashbrook. He knew I once served time. I told him all about it. Why should I want to kill him? You know why better than I do, Stuart. The fact remains that you served a five-year sentence for grand theft. Why shouldn't you want to steal now? Especially when the prize is high. Rubies. Blood-red rubies worth millions. Come in. Oh, hello, John. Come in. Well, Malcolm... I didn't do it, Mr. O'Connell. You've got to believe me. You've got to. Where are the tears of the Madonna, Malcolm? I've told the commissioner all I know. When I heard that Mr. Ashbrook had been... had been murdered, I packed a bag and caught a plane for Boston. I had to get away. I knew they'd find out about my record and... Where's Sandra Lane? Tell me the truth. Is she dead? Did you murder her, too? I don't know where Sandra is. She left the house at 8 o'clock in the morning, said she was going shopping. Did you find any discrepancies in his story, Commissioner? None so far. Checking on his statements now. I'm not lying. I'll do anything I can to help catch the murder of Mr. Ashbrook. Believe me, Mr. O'Connell, anything. Two days later, I was called back to Police Commissioner Holbrook's office. It's no use, John fellow is innocent, at least of this murder. We checked his alibi. Everything happened as he stated. What are you going to do with him, Dan? Oh, we'll have to let him go. He's got a lawyer who's a writ of habeas corpus coming up in court tomorrow morning. Judge won't keep him on the evidence we've got to offer. Ah, it's too bad. Any more leads on Sandra Lane? Not a trace. She disappeared completely. We've got to find her, no matter where she's gone, Dan. That girl had an obsession for the tears of the Madonna. We sent out a general description to every police department in the country. She'll be found, but when? Well, your guess is as good as mine. Nine months passed, and not a clue was found as to the whereabouts of Sandra Lane. Was she dead? Had she fled the country? Even the police had placed the file among those listed as unsolved cases. Malcolm Stewart, too, had disappeared into the shadows of life. Nor were the tears of Madonna found. They, too, had mysteriously vanished. It 
was a bitter ending for me. Bitter because of the murder of my friend Charles Ashbrook, and doubly so because the pledge I had made to return the jewels to the pagan goddess of High Tibet remained unfulfilled. Had the story ended? Well, as I sat in my apartment, late one cold February night, idly listening to the radio, I believed the tears of the Madonna were lost forever. This is your Mistress of Ceremonies, number 34769, bringing you another of our weekly broadcasts from the Women in Gray, direct from the LaSalle State Prison for Women. Tonight, we've got some real radio talent on the loose. <laughs> on the loose. Well, you know what I mean. In just a little while, you're going to hear number 6742 and her prison hillbillies. And wait till you hear number 4769 singing Home on the Range. She's been singing it here for over 20 years. But Women in Gray has its serious side, too. Tonight, we are opening our show with a woman in gray who writes poetry. <laughs> right out of her own head. Of course, we don't always understand it. But that doesn't mean it isn't good. She's here at the mic now, ready to... ready to to a moat, and she's as pretty as a picture. Here she is, the girl from cell 13. I want to dedicate my first poem tonight to a dear friend, M.S. Oh, heart so filled with barren thoughts, dead ashes in the stagnant brook, come not to worship at the throne of love. That voice. That voice. Jewels of the sky what shine not it? for thee, but are buried in the sea of wantonness beneath the wind-swept oak. Insidious panorama of the night, garden of lost paradise. Could it be? Filled with multi-hued rhododendrons. Thou art my vineyard. Of yes, delight. yes, it is. It's Sandra Lane. That poem was a tip-off. But how? How? Dedicated to M.S. Hey, of course, Malcolm Stewart. Jewels in C. Oh, that's not it. Jewels. Jewels buried. Of course, jewels buried in garden. Rhododendron bed beneath oak. Yes, that's it. That's it. Clever, clever girl. Holbrook. Dan, Dan, I've got a hot lead in the in the Ashbrook murder. You have? Listen, send a squad car out to Ashbrook's house immediately. Let no one escape who enters the garden. And have your men guard it with their lives, especially the flower bed. Yes, but can't you... But uh, no time to talk now. I'll see you out at the Ashbrook uh, house in 30 minutes. Sixty-five. Seventy. Seventy-six. Whew. Rhododendrons. Rhododendrons. Ah, I see someone else listening, too. You can put down your shovel, Stuart, what? and raise your hands. I'm very willing to shoot you on the spot. Okay, my... My hands are up, Mr. O'Connell. Well, we've, we've lost, I see. But it was worth it. When you've got a stake of millions, what's a life or two when it's the tears of the Madonna you're after? Well, John, I, I see you bagged your bird. And a good one, too, Commissioner. The other half of the team is quite safe in cell 13, the LaSalle State Prison for Women. We'll get her later. But for now... Take over the prisoner and charge him with aiding and abetting in the murder of Charles Ashbrook. Warren William will be back in just a moment to tell you the rest of the story in 
The Girl in the Cell 13. But first, here is a brief message from your announcer. And here again is Warren William as John Francis O'Connell. Murder will out is not an idle phrase, but this diabolical plot came within a hair's breadth of success. Sandra Lane and Malcolm Stewart entered into this conspiracy to steal the rubies long before Charles Ashbrook decided to send them back to Tibet. But his decision crystallized their mad plan. It made murder necessary. The night after I left the Ashbrook home, Sandra and Stewart met secretly. You heard, Malcolm. The tears are going to be turned over to Mr. O'Connell. Yes, I know. We must act at once. But what can we do? Leave that to me. I want you to know nothing. Then if the police catch you, you can tell nothing. You must think me a weakling. What you don't know, you can't tell. But you, where are you going? Why won't the police catch you too, especially if you're... Don't worry, I've thought it all out long ago. The police won't catch me, Malcolm. But if we're separated, Sandra, how will we it ever... It may be months, it may be months, Malcolm, but you'll hear from but me. But how, Sandra? How will I ever know oh, where listen you... listen to me. There's a radio program called Women in Grey. Women in Grey? I, I don't understand. Never miss it, Malcolm. Never miss it. And you'll hear from me. And when I do, then we meet... In Buenos and... Aires, Malcolm. In Buenos Aires. Just as we've always planned. <laughs> We know now that Sandra Lane rode into the city with her employer, stabbed him to death, and escaped with the tears of the Madonna. She hurried back to the Ashbrook home and buried the jewels in the flower garden. She fled the city and changed the color of her hair, and under an assumed name, deliberately committed a crime that netted her a short sentence in the state's prison. She reasoned rightly that she could best disappear in prison, the last place anyone would look for her. She knew, too that she could ultimately reach Malcolm Stewart through Women in Grey program. And their reward? Life sentences for both of them. But what happened to the tears of the Madonna? Well, they are again the eyes of the goddess Tsing Kapa in the temple in High Tibet. And may the curse of death that followed in their wake be forever buried in the stillness of forgetfulness. Next week, I'm going to tell you the story about a playwright who never set Broadway on fire because his plays were 50 years ahead of time. But his son, who inherited the trunk full of manuscripts, went on in his father's footsteps. He thought conditions warranted a change in modern thought. What happened to him and his father's old trunk full of manuscripts makes one of the most refreshing and modern stories that it has ever been my pleasure to tell. We call this unusual story... So deep the stream. This is Warren William inviting you to listen again next week. Strange Wills is written by Ken Crapine and directed by Robert Webster Light. Any similarity between names used on this show and those of living persons is purely coincidental. Strange Wills is a Teloways feature produced in Hollywood. <laughs>